On the Master Builders Elevate podcast today, I am joined by Chris Boyle. He's the director of Workhouse Marketing, and he's a man that brings plenty of battle scars from the building and construction industry in marketing. He's worked for group home builders. He's worked with individual construction companies. He's been involved with merchants like ITM and suppliers to the building industry like Jib. We really dig into what marketing is and how it applies to construction businesses. We talk about some simple and practical things you can do to get yourself and your businesses marketed well. We dig into what is a brand really, and here's the spoiler alert, it's not your logo. And we also dive into the process that a prospective homeowner goes through. You might be surprised to learn how many stages are involved and just how long it takes. Please welcome Chris Boyle. Hey Chris, welcome along to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great hey, to look, be here. We are very excited to have you on board today. This is this whole question around how do we do marketing is a question that comes up for our Master Builders members often. Uh, so very excited to have uh, someone of your one marketing caliber, uh, but also your knowledge uh, specifically around construction and the building industry. Um, you've got to, uh, some, what should we say, some uh, stripes, some scars, some war wounds that you've, you've earned in the, in the industry. So we, uh, yeah. Cool. So look, we'll, um, we'll find out a little bit about you and then we'll talk more about uh, your knowledge and insights into the uh, marketing construction industry specifically. Mm -hmm. But off to a few fast facts so that the audience can get to know you a little bit. Are you a uh, breakfast or dinner guy? Uh, dinner, definitely. Uh, holiday, would we find you uh, on the pool lounge with a cocktail in hand or would you be uh, jumping off a bridge with a bungee rope attached? Definitely jumping off a bridge. So I've got three uh, younger children, and um, so my, my goal in life is to get them engaged in as much outdoor activity and exciting stuff as possible at the moment. Awesome. Okay, so just to clarify that um, parenting isn't what's uh, driving you to jump off bridges? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. That's definitely what's uh, motivating me to be at the office instead of at home today. <laughs> there we go, on, on occasion. Yeah. Um, you're, if you're reading a book, Chris, are you an electronic? Do you like a Kindle or do you like the real thing? Real thing, definitely. Yep. Yeah. I spend so long on screens during the day. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's great to actually pick up a book and, and read properly. Yeah, I've been surprised with uh, so many Zoom calls and people on TV being interviewed over Zoom and that kind of thing. How many people are sitting with a huge shelf of books sitting behind them? Uh, for all the, all the digital, they're still pretty prevalent, that, that one. Yep. Okay, definitely. easy one, cats or dogs? Uh, oh, both. My parents told me when I grew up I could have a dog. Um, I'm still waiting for the dog. Um, so, so we have a cat at the moment. But Right. So uh, is this uh, acknowledgement that you haven't really grown up yet? Yeah, I think so. So I keep saying that to my wife and she just keeps saying no. So yeah, one yeah, day. Okay. Yeah, okay. You've moved from um, parent boss to wife boss, but we, yeah. we won't dig into that right now. Yes. Uh, what's your routine? Are you an early riser or a night owl? Uh, definitely early. So mm -hmm. um, I'm usually up about five mm -hmm. and um, my son gets up about six. So I like to get things in before he gets up and right. um, yeah, definitely early morning. And do you have a particular routine around that first hour of your day? Uh, definitely. Yep. So we have um, we have some clients who have offices in Australia, um, and so generally uh, I'll have some late emailing and things like that, and then there'll be some some things that I need to get done. And um, also uh, we always have campaigns running overnight, and so um, very often when our clients turn on their computer, they're always eager to see how things have gone, and so. Um, I just go through all our dashboards and make sure that I can see where things are before we get the questions in the morning. Um, and that's that's a very kind of quick thing for me to do. So, um, and then um, entertaining my son, making Milo's, getting Nutrigrain, all that sort of thing, and out the door by seven usually. Mm. Okay, so the uh, correct answer to that question, Chris, was, <laughs> you know, I get up, I have a green tea, I do 15 <laughs> minutes of meditation, um, I do half an hour of yoga, I write my goals for the day, and then I get started. But That's, yeah. Yeah, Can you edit that bit in? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll sort that. And if you're watching a, a movie, would it be a thriller or a comedy? Oh, a thriller, sci-fi, definitely. Ah, okay. um, in anything that with something that launches in space, that's me. Yeah. Right. So, are you uh, looking for the chief marketing officer role at Rocket Lab? Is that is that of interest? Either that or um, Virgin Galactic. Virgin so, um, yep. Either, either or will be good. 
Very good. I have uh, Derek Handley coming up on the podcast as a well-known um, New Zealander who is now involved with uh, Virgin Galactic. So I'll, uh, you'll, oh. have to, you'll have to ask, send me some questions to ask him. Absolutely. Yep. All righty. Hey, let's dive into marketing. Mm-hmm. And let's maybe if we start with the definition of marketing, because I think there's uh, broadly some misunderstanding about you know the role of marketing. What does it do? Where does it blend with sales, etc.? Mm-hmm. Can you give us from your perspective, Chris, what, it, what how do you define marketing? Definitely. Um, so it's um, defining marketing is one of those things where uh, I've been sitting in lectures and I've had lecture, lecturers try and tell me what marketing is and I still couldn't understand it. Um, and there's a lot of confusion around it. it. It can sometimes be used for sales tactics. So we're doing some marketing. Um, it can be used for the type of advertising that you're doing. So we're doing some marketing if we're on the radio or on the TV. Um, for me, marketing is much simpler than that, and particularly um, in relation to master builders and builders. Marketing is any activity which allows a customer to learn about you and to have preference through that knowledge. So, um, you know, when I think about a residential builder, some of the things that they might do for marketing might be around word of mouth um, and simply stating a fact in an ad, for example, to a potential client of theirs, um, for example, we are more trustworthy, uh, won't actually create the perception change that we want in a, in a client. Um, so for me, it's really around being able to communicate something so that people become aware of it and it creates a, a change in that person. I like it. Let's talk, where do we get started with, with marketing? So let's say I'm a, I'm a residential builder, yep. um, maybe uh, I'm a standalone, so I'm not part of a, a group franchise home builder who has a, you know, a marketing machine behind them, shall we say, and we might, yep. we might talk about them, but as a, as a standalone, if it's I'm someone I'm going, hey, look, I, I, I just don't know where to start with marketing, where, what yep. would be your advice on where to get going? It's a very good question. So we have uh, clients who are both group home builders and individual builders. And while I'm doing a podcast today for um, the master builders, I'm on the committee for the certified builders here in Auckland. Um, so I, I know a lot of builders, and I, so I have, have the luxury of seeing a lot of different attempts at marketing. The key thing for me, and I'll call these hygiene factors, so they're things like getting up in the morning and having a shower or getting dressed or something like that. There's some hygiene factors for being in business, and it's um, the number one one these days is having a website. So that if people search for you, they can discover you. When we talk about websites, um, there can be a lot of jargon that's thrown in there. So things like um, making sure you've got your SEO right, um, or making sure you've got a, a logo or a tagline or a vision or a mission statement or all of those things kind of nailed down. The key thing for me with um, kind of marketing for a builder is understanding that the majority of their marketing and the most valuable marketing will come from their word of mouth. Um, so clients who, after they've finished a build, going and saying to someone else, would you be interested in um, giving me a referral or, um, you know, can you refer someone to me? And that's really interesting because that means that the marketing itself goes all the way back to the process that a builder has on site. So it's around thinking about uh, communication, relationship, uh, accuracy of project management, accuracy of costs, and those kind of fundamentals. And they're, they're as important as marketing through a channel, through Facebook or a print ad or a radio ad or anything like that. So. Okay, good insights. And Chris, help us think about how we would deliver a clear message. Yep. And that, that message is not here. I'm not just talking about in a single ad or just on your website. I, I think it's more about as uh, organizations, as businesses, we need to be clear about what we stand for and what's, what's important to us. Yep. Um, we talk about things like a clear customer value proposition, yep. which is you know nice, nice words about um, when you can articulate to someone via that message you talked earlier that they're really clear about who you are and what you stand for yep and i am humored often as i as i drive around and i see tradies Mm -hmm. with uh the back of their uh, van or their ute sign written and it says we are specialists in new home builds renovations extensions maintenance but and the list goes on and on and on Mm -hmm. and i just really feel like they've missed the uh, point around what specialization means so you know i think as a as someone who may be looking for a prospective uh builder Mm -hmm. i'm going i really don't know what you're trying to be famous for yes yeah you're yeah. trying to tell me that you do absolutely everything for for anyone um so you now just look at kind of like white noise to me 
Yeah, so absolutely. How, how would, how would a, a construction company, how would they think about getting clearer about what they want to be famous for in the market? Yeah, I mean, that's a very big question. I agree with you 100% around um, the confusion. And I think uh, the builders that I see are often fearful if they say that they only do new builds and they won't get quotes for renovations and vice versa. The most successful companies that I've seen from a, a building point of view are the ones who, who have a niche and choose it. And niche can be thrown around and it becomes jargony. Um, basically, a niche means that you have the skill set and the processes internally to be able to deliver on that promise um, better than other promises you could make. Um, and the way that um, I think builders should go around determining that is just work out where they think they've got the skill set and also where they think the opportunity is in the area. We work with builders, for example, who work in the Auckland Central region where there's really no land. And so their greatest opportunity is around subdividing and building as a service or removing and building. We've got other builders who are based in Onihanga who have realized the same thing, but aren't interested in working with um, quantity surveyors and land surveyors and people like that. So their focus is on uh, renovations and they will have a very reliable um, architectural designer generally who can assist them to deliver on their customer service promise. So in terms of how they choose that, I would go back to what, what's the skill set, what's the area they live in, where is the demand, and do they truly believe that they can deliver a, a service which is better than a competitor? And um, just thinking about that, um, that idea of delivering on, a, on an offer better than a competitor, for me, I think um, when, when builders who are um, generally a husband and wife team um, think about who their customers are, a key thing is to remember that their customers are not that different to them. And so the process that a customer will go through in selecting a builder and earning trust and searching for a builder is the same as the builder themselves would go through when looking for a referral or looking for a service provider. And putting themselves in their customer's shoes should allow them to start to think, well, what, if, we were in, if we were a customer, what are the things that would make us select us? Um, and there's four statements that I like to um, kind of just use as ways of grounding what that differentiator is. So the statement that a builder makes about why they're better than someone else. And the first one is where a customer will say, I get, I love who you are. So maybe they say, um, you know, you'll have peace of mind once you let us on your, on your building site. And then they'll say, I get what you do. So uh, we do renovations, they'll say, I want what you have. You're in our area and you do kitchens. But the key thing is where a, um, a builder will say, uh, sorry, where a customer will say, and I can't get that anywhere else. When we think about a service like building, um, trying to get a client to say, I can't get that anywhere else, really doesn't come down to the materials or the merchant. Um, it comes down to the service, the communication, and really the, the impression that the potential homeowner or renovator has from the community. Okay, great, a, uh, great. Very, uh, roundabout way sorry <laughs> oh no I, I like it chris and it's um something that we uh have discussed before and and uh now at, at the breakthrough when we think about our uh, marketing propositions we're off, often using that same framework so mm. uh, maybe just to recap them yep. i love who you are i get I, what you do i want what you have and i can't get that anywhere else yep and if you stop before the i can't get it anywhere else you're undifferentiated and um, for builders, if they um, draw a parallel with building material suppliers, um, often there is a bunch of building materials which are of equal quality and equally available, and the differentiator is simply that it's available through the merchant and they can't get another one. Insulation, glass wall insulation, for example, um, quite often it's that one merchant will sell one brand and the other will sell the other. There's very little to, to differentiate where a customer or a builder will go, I can't get that anywhere else. And so if you can find that, and a, and a customer will say, I love who you are, I get what you do, I want what you have, and I can't get it anywhere else, they're going to come to you. Absolutely. Let's talk uh, a little more maybe conceptually about, about marketing before we maybe talk about some of the uh, tactically things we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, look, we're in a phenomenally challenging time in the world at the moment. We we're recording this uh, episode in August 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, New Zealand and the globe is in a pandemic of, of COVID-19. And depending on which economist you talk to or listen to or observe, by and large, they're predicting some kind of significant slowdown in the housing market and yep. construction generally, mm -hmm. uh, certainly around our 
construction clients and members of master builders that we talk to, they're going, hey, look, it seems to be doing okay at the moment. We've got lots of kind of that pre-pipe of work that we're getting through, but we're, we're a little concerned about what happens on the other side. Mm. Yeah, I think the uh, piece around marketing here is um, – how should we think about marketing? Is it something we should just go, hey, look, we, we can see a little bit of a slowdown in our current work, so let's hit the market really hard with our marketing now and see if we can generate some more demand? Mm -hmm. Or is it something we should be looking at driving kind of consistency into how we deliver marketing? Of course, my thought is that some people in the construction industry have been in a reasonably good state for a number of years. There's been reasonably high demand. There's been plenty of work around. So sometimes you can end up with good work without doing a lot of marketing yep. and possibly without even doing a spectacular job yep. because the the only differentiator required was that you had some bodies that you could put on a building site. Mm -hmm. If we look at a potential, and I do say potential, I'm not an economist and I can't, and my crystal ball's not working that well, so I, I don't know what's coming down the, down the pipe, yep. but we go, we could end up in a situation where almost the power comes to the consumer. Mm -hmm. There is going to be more builders available to do work, so they're going to be able to be more choosy yep. and they're going, to be look, they're going to be looking to work through that kind of four-step framework. Yep. So as a construction company, how should we be thinking about, about uh, our approach to marketing? You know, once and done versus the small and often maybe is the is the is the inverse. Yep. yep. So there is um, there's a, a fundamental truth that repetition builds trust. The more that people see your brand over time, the more they will begin to trust it. So I am a big fan of always on marketing. So and I'll, I'll talk about how how you can do that um, economically in a mo. But um, I'm definitely a fan of always on. You know, if we think about differentiating ourselves via the channels that we've got and the channels that are affordable and easily accessible these days are digital. Um, a benchmark for me mentally when I'm talking to clients is that one full page ad in a magazine is about three and a half to four thousand um, dollars. And so for me, if we can do things that are cheaper and we can be sure that our message is getting in front of the right people, then that's, that's a much better spend. And we're really lucky that digital marketing is exceptionally cheap relative to other forms of marketing. So the, the key thing for me is kind of building on the idea of the website that we talked about before. So building a website these days doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to look like it's an agricultural website. It can look elegant and beautiful. And when I use words like that, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm trying to put our builders in, the, um, in their customer's shoes. So trying to think about what would a customer like, not, not what do I like. And we need something that appeals to them. So um, there are online website builders. And um, one of my favorites for companies that want to do it at home is Squarespace. Squarespace has really nice templates and it allows you to kind of build a, a beautiful website quickly. Once you've got a website built, the next question is, well, how do you get um, the information which is in there out to the market? When I talk about this, people always come back and say, for example, I love Instagram, or I hate Instagram, or I love Facebook, or I hate Facebook, or um, I'm always on Trade Me, or something like that. And again, what we need to do is not to think about what we like and where we spend our time, but where our audience likely spends, spends their time. And um, when we do that, we also should think, what, what is the location where our audience is that's the easiest for us to get to? The easiest way for me uh, to help a builder put their toes in the water with marketing and communication is to suggest that they set up a Facebook page and to start putting their content on there. A few years back, we used to think that Facebook required someone who was 18 to 20 who knew the right acronyms and could put screaming goats on there and get people's attention. I really encourage builders to think about Facebook simply as a channel, no different to TV, radio or magazine. All, all it does is it provides us a vehicle for us to put our information on and for people to see it. The next thing is to think about a tendency in the past for us to try and get people to like our page. And also that's something that I encourage, um, I think particularly builders, not to focus on. The reason for that is, and that might sound counterintuitive, if, for example, one of us is, you know, at a, at a certain time of the year, for example, looking for carpet, we will have put no time in the past into liking, for example, a Cavalier Brimworth Facebook page at all. And so any, any likes that I have generated prior to that won't relate to the customers who on a given day might be interested in my product. And that is very true for builders. You know, people might go through a process 
considering building over a two-year page, but they, they may spend no time liking or acknowledging a builder's Facebook page. So we're very lucky that Facebook provides us um, good targeting opportunities to get to our audience, and there's two different ways that we can do that. One, so once we have a Facebook page, is to place a post and boost it. And you can do that from within Facebook. And Facebook will allow you to target people who are, for example, in the market and looking for lending, who have pre-approved mortgages, um, who have uh, a certain number of kids, um, who have a certain income, a certain age, and so on. Um, so you can do that very easily. And, and um, there is a large number of YouTube videos out there which will provide very simple step-by-step -step guides for people to do that first boosted post. In terms of budget, and I've provided that benchmark before of a full page ad, um, if you are trying to advertise in your geographic area where you're interested in attracting clients, um, and let's say it's as broad as Auckland, you might spend a budget of say $10 to $20 a day on that. And that would be sufficient for you to get your ads in front of um, people who are interested. There is a second more advanced stage in terms of targeting, and that's where Facebook offers a, a second platform called the Facebook Business Manager. Going into the Facebook Business Manager for the first time can be quite overwhelming. The, um, the presentation on the screen um, is really based on people having a deep understanding of advertising and targeting. And if what I found with builders is if they begin there, it can completely destroy any hope they've got of, um, of being able to place ads. So the thing that I, just kind of bringing that back to a close, the thing I'd encourage people to do is to um, set up a Facebook page, put some posts on there and boost them. You know, if, if we talk about what might be the content in those posts, what I would do is I would base the content, not in terms of lots and lots of information with lots of images, but small snippets of information which reinforce our value proposition. So the differentiator that we want to be known for. And so it might be that you put up a paragraph which um, talks about how you've just finished a uh, renovation or you've just finished a remove and build. Um, and here's a picture of the before and after. One of the reasons I encourage builders to do that is that there can often be paralysis in generating content. Mm -hmm. And um, it is more important to have small snippets reinforcing the value, which allow people who are in their target audience to learn slowly over time. Cool. Um, Chris, really good uh, insights and guidance there for us. Mm -hmm. Look, I couldn't recommend more that you actually seek professional help to, to get this set up for you, right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's it's a bit like me going, um, hey, look, I don't mind the odd weekend uh, building project. So yes. now I think I'll go and have a crack at actually building a house. Like it would oh, just, yeah. it would be a disaster, right? I think yep. it's, it's the same thing. Marketing requires expertise. Mm -hmm. And whilst we can jump in and kind of put up our own Facebook pages and build our own yep. websites using a lot of those tools that are out there, yep. there's a real difference between... Uh, Yes. Getting those things set up well and doing them properly. Look, I just I just couldn't recommend enough that just like you'd hire a uh, master builder to come and build your house, hire, hire, hire the equivalent of a master marketer to come and help you get set up. Now, once mm. you're set up, you may well be able to go and continue getting some things done yourself and use some of your internal resource, mm -hmm. but spend a bit of cash up front and get it get it set up right. The the dividends are, are huge yes. and we're in that zone in construction where... Uh, you know, one one sale mm -hmm. uh, really can pay for, you know, maybe a couple of years in your marketing. Yep, 100%. So, yep. so yeah, guidance would definitely be, uh, you know, seek seek professional professional help yep. uh, around, around doing that. Okay, yep. let's talk a little bit about your uh, understanding of the buyer journey that people go through. You've been, fortunately, you've done some quite deep research in this. Yep. Um, I think the example that came to mind for me was an anecdote. We've had uh, mm -hmm. a number of friends that have gone through the new house build process. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting just observing very mm -hmm. gender stereotypical. So I'm not saying this is the case everywhere, but uh, certainly in, in our experience, we've had predominantly the female in the relationship be the one that does all the sort of initial research, does a yep. lot of the, oh, I think these guys would be good to talk to and I really like their houses and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, predominantly, Again, uh, stereotyping, male comes in to a bit later in the process and goes, oh, yeah, okay, so yeah, now you've convinced me we really should be building a new house. Let's, yep. let's get on with it. So 
you know, again, thinking about who are we talking to at what stage of the, the process, that's just a, a piece that's really obvious to me. But you've gone deeper, you've run research groups, you've done all sorts around this. So can you share some of your, your knowledge for us around what, what the kind of buyer behaviour journey looks like for a, for a new home purchaser? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think we, we all know that, um, that any sort of renovation or building that requires consent takes a considerable amount of time. And um, most of the journeys we see will begin uh, two years before um, ground is broken. And that's as um, the potential customer begins to sit on the sofa at night and looks at Travi and begins thinking about moving or renovating or building. And it, there's usually quite a process as they, they come to the decision that, yes, they are going to undertake a builder. And um, we know that there is a, a huge amount of nervousness about buying new instead of buying used. And that's because uh, there's nervousness that the dream that people have or the war stories that they've heard about how things can go wrong will happen to them. And I, uh, even builders who I know who are rock solid, super reliable, will have unexpected things come up on the job. And we see it even when it's um, entirely outside of the control of the builder. So for example, where you begin groundworks and pipes in the wrong place, the builder can, can become lumbered with that, um, that issue for a lack of communication and so on. So in terms of the process, we know that there is an inspiration phase for um, potential new home builders, new home clients or renovators, where they begin to look around and explore and, and dream a bit. We know that as they start to engage with builders, they go through a reassurance phase. And so they start to um, talk to their friends and they start to interview builders and they start to look for stories online and things that will reassure them that they're going to make the right decision. And then when they, um, as they get closer, they go into a stage where the builder really needs to move into that convincing and reassuring phase. And that's where kind of the sales tactics come in around demonstrating that there's a good process, um, that there's good communication, um, that there's going to be lots of photos, making sure that there's a lot of clarity around pricing. So for example, fixed pricing might be from the slab up, um, but anything below that might not be, and also around timing. And so we go through this inspiration phase and that's a really nice time for builders to be advertising. And if they have a website, putting photos of finished um, projects and testimonials on there, that reassurance phase uh, where they meet and, and work together. And some of the best builders that I know uh, work as a husband and wife team. and. Um, to your point around potentially there being uh, different roles for the um, in the husband and wife team, if that's what it is, there's definitely roles there for the builder and wife if it is a, a small privately owned business to support the potential customer then. And then as the process goes, um, kicks off and the job's underway, there is a further stage around support. And there is, through all of our research, the thing that we see time and time again is that there can never be too much communication just making sure that there are regular catch-ups, that there is a place where photos are shared, um, that there's an accurate timeline, any way of communicating the process to the client will in the end help that word of mouth which will get you your next job. Yeah, and this comes back to your first point that the, the actual build process is such a critical part of your marketing because yeah. if you do, a, you do a great job, then the people that you're doing this build for, they will talk to their friends. Uh, people tend to be in similar zones and similar stages of life with the people they're friends with. So, you know, if they're, if they're in the zone of building a, a house, there's a good chance that the people they're friends with will also be in a, a similar zone to doing that as well. 100%. Yep. I, I, I was just going to uh, add into that the uh, piece around brand. And, you know, as uh, marketers yep. and maybe people that we're around a lot, we hear the word brand a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sense is that brand is often misconceived. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just give us a bit of your um, kind of insight there, Chris, on uh, what maybe some people think brand is, but what it, what it really is? Yep. So people often think that their brand is their logo, their word mark. That is part of your brand. We spend a lot of time trying to get a brand that we like and looks good. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, a brand is the perceptions and the thoughts that people put against it. So if we start to think about really well-known brands, for example, Apple or Pack and Save or Toyota, um, we immediately think about our perceptions and our awareness of that brand. The logo itself, the word mark or the name of the company, uh, begins to matter significantly less than the perceptions and the reputation that it has. We can get really hung up on building a brand because it's something that we put a great deal of pride into. It is an expression of us as a person 
and we, um, you know, we want people to see our brand and to think that we're achieving things as business owners. Um, but the strongest brands are the ones where that word of mouth and the reputation um, and the stories that go with it um, enable you to get more work. We see a lot of time spent on getting graphics right, whereas it should really come down to the focus on communication, service delivery, and so on. So, yeah, I had it explained to me that uh, brand is every single thing that you do as a as a business, mm. and so that's everything from yes, the the artwork you use for your for your logo, but it's also how are your team presented on on site. Yep. What do your vehicles look like? What is your communication style? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the um, uh, analogy is if you went and bought a Ferrari, you wouldn't expect to turn up to the service department and it's kind of all dirty and there's no. uh, old bits of car lying around and the guys are in greasy overalls and you're thinking, well, that, that person's going to be leaning on my uh, million dollar car. Yes. You know, same thing where uh, we've got people's dreams in our hands here as construction people yep. and, and we want that experience to be uh, fit for purpose for whatever you, you're building. Now, Absolutely. If I was building a uh, pole shed for a barn, mm -hmm. you know, it might be really appropriate and very on brand for me to turn up in uh, a Swanee and gumboots to meet the owner on site. That might be absolutely spot on. Mm -hmm. If I'm meeting someone and I'm about to build them a, a $7 million mansion in the middle of the CBD or, mm -hmm. you know, the CBD in the, in the um, city, then yep. uh, I might, I might be looking for a different uh, approach to my branding as I, as I approach that meeting and, and where I'd hold it, et cetera. A hundred percent. Yep. Okay. I mean, if we if we look at the um, group home builders, and we look at the professionalism of the franchisees who own the franchise, mm -hmm. um, they always turn up impeccably dressed with everything branded nicely and yep. uh, ready to go. And again, it comes back to this idea of I see sometimes with builders. Builders think I've gone into business and I'm a Kiwi, and in New Zealand we can be casual, and casual is okay. You know, suits don't matter, and so on. And, I never want to work a day of my life in the office, but that is true to a certain point. But then we also have to put and put ourselves into the um, the shoes of our customers and think, how will we get this customer to to have a hundred percent confidence that providing a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars to us is going to be safe? And if that means that you have to have a shower and you have to have a shave and you have to turn up um, with a with a wash car it's absolutely worth doing. Um, I, I know one builder in particular who does a lot of work, a lot of high-end work, uh, and he will carry around a couple of changes of clothes in the car. Um, and I know that may sound facetious, but he will, um, before he, once he leaves sites, he, site, he will change his shoes, he'll change his shirt, and he will then go and see a client. I'm, I'm not sure everyone needs to do that, but absolutely, to your point, I think that um, the professionalism and the customer service promise that you want to put across has to be consistent and well presented always. And I think it is about identifying your genius. And we know many uh, construction business owners that they they don't want to be the front person for the business. They don't want to do the sales. They don't want to be doing the customer meet and yep. greets. They are just phenomenal carpenters, phenomenal project managers, and they they just do a great job of being on site. But they've identified that that is their genius, and so that's what they're good at. And they've put other resources in the business to help them do those those other bits that they they don't want to spend time on. And I think that that's not okay. That's just smart thinking yep so be, being clear on your genius and where you want to fit in your processes is, a, is really important yep part of what, what's going on okay i i had a, a question do you have a sense of the percentage of revenue that you would give guidance that a, a construction company should be spending on marketing it's a good question um if they're not spending one to three percent um then they're definitely under um under spending the, the reason I pause a little bit is because I don't want to encourage people to spend money so that they feel like they're hitting targets. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to invest in marketing. Um, for me, the other thing that comes to mind is that marketing should self-fund. For some reason, when we think about marketing these days, people feel that if they, you know, to my earlier point, they've set up a website, they're on Facebook, or they've made a radio ad or something that they've ticked a box, and at the end of it, they will look at their spend and go, oh, it didn't work, but we tried it. There's a really famous quote from a, um, a retailer in New York, half the money I spend on marketing is wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. These days, that is something that we, we absolutely don't have to do. Um, with our access to analytics from our websites and from our digital advertising, um, or even from magazine advertising or printed channels, 
we can be sure that we are getting value for money and we can be sure before we place ads that the channel is going to deliver. There will be a history of um, from someone else or from, a, um, from within our industry that should give us confidence that the money we spend is going to return the result that we want. And it's a really good thing to think, what is the measure of success from this advertising that I'm doing? From, from anything, any message that I'm going to place on any channel, what is the measure of success? And if you hit that measure of success, then your marketing will be self-funding. Um, you know, if we're spending a dollar, we should have an expectation of a lead, for example, or, or whatever the, the number is. And um, so to your point, how much should companies spend? Um, I think between 1% and 3% is toes in the water. And if you have a, have a good message and a consistent message and it's placed in the right places, you would quickly find that you, you want to spend more because you can see that there is exponential uh, growth coming back from it. Yep. Great. And for the listeners on the podcast today who might be more mature in their marketing, they've, uh, you know, they've got the Facebook page, they've got the website, they've got some budget committed to marketing each time. Maybe mm -hmm. they're using a professional, they're using an agency to help them. Yeah. Uh, what would you, what would you say? What would be the questions they should be asking their agency? The thing that the thing that I would ask is um, just to just to have transparency over anything that the agency is doing. We see examples where, for example, builders who are who are excellent builders are spending a lot of money on this thing called SEO, and I'm happy to expand on that in a mo. Um, or spending a lot of money on AdWords because that's what they've been told they should do. If that is the case, you should be able to see a change in behaviour on your website or the leads coming in from either of those two two things. So. Um, the thing that I'd encourage um, builders or building companies to do is to look for transparency and to seek a metric, some number that lets them know that the amount that they're spending is worth it, that they're getting a return. The other thing is once they've got all of those hygiene factors taken care of, so they've got some channels set up and they've got the website set up um, and their guys are looking great and they've got a customer service promise that they can deliver on consistently, then it's it's time to start thinking, well, how can I build my reputation outside of those simple things? Um, and, you know, we often see, for example, a lot of um, building companies putting money into sponsorship, as an example. Um, and sponsorship, as an example, can be really useful. But I try and encourage builders to put the sponsorship spend into one of three buckets, if you like. Um, and that is leverage, legacy, or donation. So... For example, if we spend a dollar on, or let's say a thousand dollars on a sponsorship, and we can see that immediately we're getting a return from it. So that type of sponsorship for me is leverage. So we know that we're spending a dollar and we're getting ten dollars back. We might also decide that we want to sponsor the local club rooms. And so we spend ten dollars on the sign, and we know through that goodwill over time, but maybe over a longer time, that we will see people who belong to those club rooms coming back and working with us. So for me, that's a type of legacy sponsorship where we're going into the local community and supporting it. Now, on that scale I gave before, if we're spending $1,000 on leverage, so I can sponsor, for example, uh, taking my clients to the blues and they're definitely going to work with me, so it's a no-brainer. On legacy, we might spend $100 on that scale, so about 10%. We might put a sign up at the local club rooms. And if it's neither of those things, so if, uh, if our nephew owns a race car and we put our building company name on the side of it, we have to be honest that that is basically a donation. We're not going to see that back. So for a mature marketer, um, sponsorship can be useful. An example of um, good legacy type of sponsorship might be, for example, um, sponsoring the raincoats that the kids at the local crossing have at the school. So when the parents come up every day, they get to see the brand on these, and that's a very cheap thing to do because you're replacing half a dozen raincoats once every three years, for mm -hmm. example. So for a mature marketer, I would look for opportunities to get my brand out into the market like that. And the other thing I would do is look at further differentiating. And for me, one of those ways is through moments of surprise and delight. So, you know, if we go to, um, for example, Cavalier Brimworth, with my example before, when I get home, I have samples. And when guests come around, I talk to them about it and we can put it down and we compare it. Creating something for a potential customer that they can take home and have at home and creates that moment when they will talk to someone else and say, you know what, I went to see my builder and they've given me this and is also really useful. And those don't have to be expensive and they don't have to be alcoholic, um, but they do have to be creative and they have to create that moment where a customer goes, 
I'm going to share this story and it demonstrates that the builder cares about me. Have you got an example, Chris, of a construction company that has done something like that? Um, I have. I, um, I have. I, probably my, um, my favourite examples of that sort of thing, uh, we work with a hardware supplier, so a hardware merchant who supplies door handles and so on. And with that company, they're trying to get uh, homeowners' attention. And traditionally, customers who are buying hardware have gone to the merchant that a builder uses. So it's quite hard for a, um, a merchant that only sells hardware to get their attention. And so um, what we've done is that um, that merchant has provided a box and they provide a free sample to the customer when they come in. So entirely free of charge. So when they go home, as with the carpet, they're able to show this hardware to their friends and family and say, what do you think about this? Um, that particular company has also created hangers that go like a um, do not disturb sign at a hotel. And it's transparent. So when the customer goes home, they can put it up on the door and they can actually see how the handle would look on, the, on a door that's at their house. Cool. Um, and the cost of the hanger is minimal and it allows a, a potential homeowner to take home 20 different handles and to swap them over and to have a look at it. So things like that just create that moment where the story will continue at home. So mm, good, good example. Chris, I'm interested you've been around a lot of marketing projects, both in construction industry and, and more, more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, give us uh, maybe a couple of standouts, ones, campaigns you've either observed or been involved in. We've gone, wow, that was really good. And maybe an example of, of one where you're like, oh, that's not so good. Yep. So my uh, one that we've worked on, um, so one of our clients is Jib, uh, Windstone Warboards, and uh, we ran a campaign for them when Weatherline was launched uh, last year. It, it was a big change for Jib because they were suddenly selling temporary cladding, something to go on the outside of the house, and traditionally they had been known for supplying um, products in, internally. So we spent a lot of time, uh, both with builders and with architects, understanding their perceptions around it. And, um, and understanding how we, could, how we could get the message through and build some confidence. So there was, a, there was a raft of things that we did, but one of the things that I enjoyed the most was we sent out samples of Weatherline to architects and builders, and we knew that there would be some reluctance to kind of get it wet, because traditionally, you know, you don't want to put plasterboard in mortar. And so we printed the, um, the messaging on the samples with a hydrochromic print. So when it was received, it had to be run underwater to see ah, the message. Very cool. So, um, yeah, so we, we encouraged them to do that. And the nice thing about that is that that creates a, a moment where people share it a lot, which is fantastic. I did some work also with ITM a few years back. And um, while I was working with them, uh, there was a new store opening uh, up north. We sent to builders, in that case, a timber box with an east wing hammer. And uh, they had to bring it in store and they smashed a jar and they, they got something. And we had about a 70% uptake on that campaign. And there was a tremendous movement to the new store and, and awareness of the new store that came from that. So that was really good. Gold. Um, well done. The, the, things that, um, the things that stand out for me as failures is where I see um, a lot of money being spent without um, a measure of the, the spend. And we sometimes see ads which are placed which just say, we are builders for example, or we do renovations. When I see those sort of ads, the thing that's always missing is the next step. So click here to learn more or give us a call or even you know text something to whatever the number is to, and we'll give you a call or some way of ensuring that if, if the message that we has, have um, put out there um, resonates with the customer, that they have a mechanism for communicating further. And you know, I would love to give you a single example of that, but Honestly, you just have to kind of like go online or look in a magazine and, and there are so many of them where you can just see someone has simply said like, we're in business and, and expected something to come back from it. So, mm -hmm. Yep, good, good examples. Alrighty, Chris, let's kind of wrap there. Look, your insights have been uh, fantastic. If I could maybe make an attempt at a summary of some of the key points you've, you've made. Mm -hmm. um, I think that four-step framework you talked about earlier is just a great way for as a starting point uh, with marketing or as a review of what you're doing already, answering does our marketing explain to potential customers, um, I love who you are. So do they, do they, do they love us, what we're about? Do they get what we do? Mm -hmm. Gold. Um, and I want what you have. So, uh, you know, that would be around that specialization, things that we were talking about there. And then that differentiating part of going, I can't get that anywhere else. So 
I think they're, they're good questions to ask regardless of where you are in your marketing maturity. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got some fundamentals in today's world, which just goes, uh, if I'm in the construction sector, you've got to have a, a website that, that delivers mm -hmm. and, you know, delivers is, uh, would be that piece where we're going, Hey, get, get an expert to help you with, with that. Um, and then Facebook or social media, uh, are finding the appropriate channels in those because they give you such great, uh, ability to target an audience and target people that would be interested in what you're doing would be fantastic. I think you've made it really clear that our, our brand and what we do and some of the best things we can do in marketing is just do a really great job of being a, a construction company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the, the challenge with that is that uh, that can be uh, two or three years with, with a, you know, right from a prospect, uh, getting them to the line where we start breaking ground and then everything that goes on out to a, to a build. Mm -hmm. And I have heard some exceptionally challenging stories of builders that were doing handovers and you know they've got customers uh, getting down on their hands and knees looking to see whether the skirting is 100 percent and bringing levels and yep. the, the ability to grin and smile after after a three-year journey when you're just like i really want to get onto my next project mm -hmm. to suck it up keep smiling and keep reminding yourself that that person is going to go away and tell their friends just how amazing you've you've been mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> hard to do, very hard to do, yeah. but uh, um, I think that's that's valuable. And there are you know simple things we can do. Yes, we can get very clever with marketing. Some of those things are really appropriate. Uh, one of the good stories I'd heard, which I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, is uh, a builder who uh, once they'd completed a home, they'd find out from the owner if they were having housewarming. Mm -hmm. And if they were, they said, hey, look, uh, we'd love to drop around some uh, drinks for you to, you know, compliment your on your building success. They'd go around, uh, bring the drinks around to the housewarming. And of course, they'd arrive and the person go, oh, this is this is Bob and Jane, our builders. You know, you've got to come and meet my friends. You've done such a great job. And suddenly they were being presented to all the friends as the, the best yep. people ever. Yep. So, you know, really simple, but you don't get to do that. But unless you've done a fantastic job all the way, all the way through. So kind of a little, little example there. Chris, I'm sure there'll be some people that are going, well, the guy really knows what he's talking about. He's uh, obviously a great industry experience and I'd love to connect. Where's the best place for people to come and uh, talk to you, Chris? So we've got a website, um, www.whm.co.nz. That's for workhouse marketing, but whm.co.nz. And um, they can send us an email, give us a call um, straight from there. And um, yeah, always, always happy to um, make contact. Um, we, uh, in terms of what we do, we uh, obviously um, create brands and, and run ad campaigns and uh, build websites. And in terms of how we work, if someone makes contact, we give them a brief, a budget and a timeline, and then it's, it's over to them. So. Yeah. Chris, I'd like to acknowledge you, one, for giving up your time to share your insights uh, with us on the on the podcast today, but also a personal endorsement. We've done some work with Workhouse Marketing as uh, the breakthrough and uh, just found your really practical approach. No BS, no fluff, just uh, those things you talked about, a solid brief, a good timeline and a budget and measuring all the time to see whether what we're doing is, is working. Yeah, I'd like to add my personal endorsement for what you're doing. So thanks for joining us today and uh, encourage plenty of people to get out there um, have a discussion with Chris is always open to have a chat and see how he can help with your marketing journey. Cool. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Thanks for having me.